handed me a, a, a greeting card and I opened it and uh, it literally said, it's like, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't know. To just have only certain outcomes and career choices be determined based on your culture, that's just so odd to me. Were there challenges that you've experienced because of your race or your ethnicity? 1000% yes. Welcome to Meaningful, Marketing, Mentoring, Mattering, with me, Joseph Alcantara. Together, we'll uncover the power of purpose, experience mentorship magic, unpack ways to make a difference, and find transformative journeys as a community. Welcome to Meaningful, Marketing, Mentoring, Mattering, with me, Joseph Alcantara. This month, we're celebrating the rich cultural heritage and significant contributions of the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Join us as we dive into stories of innovation, resilience, and influence in the world of marketing and beyond, and how the community's involvement make a meaningful impact. Before we dive in, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and notification bell so you're updated every time we have a new episode. Today, our special guest is Shane Santiago. He is a president and chief experience officer overseeing creative strategy and implementation at Bravely through a breadth of experience from startups to Madison Avenue agencies, Shane has brought big ideas to world-renowned brands like Marriott International, Johnson & Johnson, the Jacksonville Jaguars, FX Networks, Houston Rockets, Under Armour, Disney, the NBA, Discovery Channel, Paramount Pictures, and Sony Pictures, and snagging multitude of industry honors along the way. His entrepreneurial drive has been applied across categories, including automotive, food and beverage, sports and entertainment, technology, apparel, education, travel and hospitality, financial and nonprofits. He's been published in top industry publications such as Advertising Age, Adweek, Communication Arts, and Mashable. Please welcome to the pod, Shane Santiago. Hi, Shane. Hey there. Thank you so much for having me, Joseph. Appreciate it. Well, I'm very much honored to have you on the pod today. Um, I've read your bio, but I'm sure that behind that very enriching and inspiring bio is a rich story as well. So I'll ask you the first question that I ask all my guests, and that is, what is your meaningful life story? Take us back to that beautiful background, origin story, and lived experience. Gosh, no, that's, that's a great question. It's always a tough one to answer in a succinct way. Uh, so I was born in Hawaii, uh, you know, although I was born in Hawaii and that's part of sort of my, my lived experience and culture, we moved to Jacksonville, Florida when I was pretty young. So I actually consider uh, Jacksonville home. I went to the University of Florida, studied advertising, but advertising wasn't, uh, you know, on the list in terms of, you know, fields of, of study or, or professional options when it came to, you know, growing up, we didn't know anything about that. Of course, my, my parents were like, oh, you got to be good in math and science and all that stuff. And I always um, really wanted to be an artist. Um, so there was always that sort of duality of, you know, wanting to, you know, please your folks and make them make them proud. But, you know, the sort of draw of, of being creative and being an artist was it was always I was I've been drawing since I was since I can remember. Um, so I went to school for architecture at the University of Florida. Uh, uh, quickly understood that that wasn't for me. Um, it just it didn't sort of fulfill that that creative itch that I had and um, switched that major pretty quickly over to something that was completely new to to me and again uh, culturally as as I'm sure we'll discuss in the and the Asian community was advertising and that was a that sent a pretty big shockwave through uh, the our our household as 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 my my parents didn't understand what that was are you going to be a journal what what does that even mean and I didn't know either <laughs> all I knew was that it seemed cool it, it let me uh, explore different avenues of, of balancing creative with with being innovative I hustled and luckily I, I landed a, a job at Ogilvy, New York right out of school um, and was really thrown to the wolves um, in a good way, certainly. Um, and uh, again, I was lucky. My first creative director, my first boss was was Asian. He was Thai. So right off the bat, um, 
had an opportunity to connect with someone who um, looked like me, uh, but I, I didn't really know it was, you know, it was a thing that there would be, that wouldn't be there, that wouldn't be present throughout my career. It wasn't until after that, till I noticed the, the discrepancy and, and the gap with, with leadership um, and, and representation. So I was very, very lucky to get that in my first job. And, um, you know, through the years, I just sort of meandered uh, through various, you know, big holding agency companies. And I decided about halfway, about 10 years into my career that I was um, ready to try something new and something different and um, started my first digital creative agency called SBS Studios and uh, moved back to Jacksonville, Florida, um, just to have a little bit of a home base there, had a, a really really great experience again harrowing and scary and, and all those things and we were acquired uh four years into that which was pretty amazing never set out to be an entrepreneur never, i always just thought you know i'll just be i'll just keep my head down work hard i'll, I'll work my way up you know the corporate ladder as it were as we we're sort of taught to do in our culture right just keep your head down work hard and the and the rewards and the accolades and and the recognition will come and I think, you know, in the real world, it just doesn't work that way. So, you know, I think I, that's when I decided to to start that first business. And when we were acquired, it was a sort of sign of like, hey, we did something right. And um, uh, four years into that, I decided I was ready again to to try something different. Lo and behold, that's where we are now. I started Bravely, a creative consultancy. It's a little bit of a different twist uh, on on creative uh, development and an agency-like entity and um loving it so far. It's it's an adventure every single day. And I get to meet cool people like you and, um, you know, be a part of an awesome community of, of, of smart and interesting folks and learn from folks. And it's, it's just, I love it. Wow. Hearing your story right now, I realized that it is consisted of chapters and pauses of twists and turns and right decisions and following your passion and following your heart probably even you not know exactly what the outcome would be. Let's go back to the beginning when you were navigating that journey, letting your folks know that hmm, it's not going to be the medical or the financial field, not even architecture, but I'm going to you know, shift gears and do something else that probably is not so familiar with um, the Asian family household. How did you navigate that path, letting your parents know that I'm going to try advertising and explaining to them what that is all about. They still don't, they still don't know what I do, uh, you know, 25 years later. Uh, now, as you can imagine, it was a, a, a challenging conversation. It was a sort of like a grenade. I sort of threw it over and just kind of went like that. Um, and uh, I think it does speak to um, representation at large, right? And I think uh, to just have only certain outcomes and career choices be determined based on your culture. That's just so odd to me. Um, so I knew even back then I was like, well, why is it? Why why is it such a bad thing if I don't want to be an engineer? I, I, my sisters are engineer. We we all we all took different paths. And again, I was always just into the sort of creative side. And I was like, what's so bad about it? And you know, we I grew up just always knowing that I would have to switch at some point. Like you're never gonna you're gonna starve if you're an artist. All of those things. So when I decided to make that decision, it was not an easy one for sure. Because again, you know, in our culture, we want to make our parents uh, proud. You know, they work hard for it. My dad's a first generation immigrant. So he was born and raised in the Philippines and, you know, had a, he has talk about chapters and twists and turns and, and my mom is Filipino also. And so, you know, they had their own set of challenges. So I think, you know, as, as good Asian children, we, we often, um, really set forth an expectation for our parents just to make sure like, Hey, your sacrifice was worth it. So I'm, you know, we're not going to stray too far from that path. So there was always that balance of, you know, doing right for yourself, but also not wanting to disappoint the people who, you know, fed you and raised you and, <laughs> and all of that. So, so when, when I decided to make that change, it was just, um, you know, candidly, it was, it was, it was hard. There was a complete sort of blow up. You know, I, I talked, I got advice from like my sisters. I'm the youngest of eight kids. I got advice from all my siblings and they're like, you know, just do it, whatever. It's fine. And then, you know, I told my dad, and of course he's um, not very happy. And he called all of my siblings was like, why did you let Shane do this? <laughs> um, and they're like, wait, I mean, look, listen, he's got to, he's got to figure it out on his own. And, but I, I've told the story where um, I think 10 or 15 years into my career, the time where I started you know, getting re industry recognition for our work and, and you know, getting acquired. Uh, my dad actually wrote me a sort of apology note 
um, which is, you know, not something that, you know, I don't know, you know, I can't speak for other families and, you know, like our, our family just wasn't like that. Again, it's sort of typical. There wasn't a lot of, a ton of affection, sort of lots of love. I don't want to paint a picture of, of anything like that, but you know, it was just, it wasn't a lot of, of that. He handed me a, a, a greeting card and I opened it and um, it was like, it literally said, it's like, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I did. I'm so proud of you. I didn't know what it entailed. I just wanted the best for you, but you, you know, you've proved that you, you've made the right choice. And I'm just so proud of you. And I was like, that type of stuff just didn't happen in our family. Um, I, I kept that card with me and I kept it in my work bag and I would, I just took it to work every day ever since. And it was just one of those, those sort of like, you know, affirmations, you know, we do, there's a number of reasons and a number of motivators that, that, that keep us going every day, whether it be, you know, promotions or, you know, keeping your family fed. And I think that's just one of the many inputs that I think, you know, motivated me from that point was, look, I did something right. It was a little risky. Um, and to get that sort of nod from your, 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 your parents who admittedly just didn't understand was a huge accomplishment in my book, better than any of the awards I've received. That's for sure. Love that. It's like a huge risk, but it went back with a huge validation as well. Hearing that story about a card from your dad apologizing and letting you know after, you know, X number of years that he's proud of what you are doing and what you've done is just probably the most amazing, one of the most amazing stories of, you know, an Asian dad explaining and being, you know, accepting sure. of, you know, a young kid not saying yes to everything that they would want you to do. That's right. Right. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, yeah. it's, that's why it was just so remarkable. So yeah, I mean, you get it. And I think, you know, for, for folks outside our culture, again, to, they may not think that's such a big deal, but, you know, for, for those of us who grew, grew up in the same that, way that I'm sure, you know, you have the, a, a similar experience um, that, that is a very remarkable thing. And that's why it mm -hmm. meant so much. That's true. And I think um, the parallel to it, the way you've shared your story about your, you know, first creative director or your first mentor in the advertising field, luckily, you know, looks like you um, from Thailand, but you're also in a network agency, Ogilvy, by the way, apparently we're, you know, co-alumnus, I would have to say, I was with Ogilvy in Singapore though, um, awesome, which awesome. is quite interesting. Um, and I've also learned a lot from the agency for sure. A lot of the things that I'm doing right now, I've learned from it. What was that experience like? You know, I think that is very rare for folks to say that I've learned from someone who understands me, who looks like me, who are, who is also in the same industry, especially in our field, uh, because I am hearing a lot of younger folks today where their dilemma is like, first, I am not recognized, I'm not seen, I don't see myself well represented, which at the end of the day becomes a reason for me not to have the opportunity to progress in the career, sure. not to have the promotion, not to learn more or not to be exposed to big opportunities. What was that experience like to you? And what can you tell folks who are experiencing the opposite of that today? Yeah. Uh the experience was, I, again, I, I, I couldn't be more grateful. I still draw upon that, uh, that experience. And, you know, it was more than, it was almost 25 years ago. Um, and I still point to it as, as one of my most formative experiences in my life um, because of that, because there was someone who as a leader, uh, you know, really sort of understood that uh, without being overt about it. Right. Again, I didn't, I didn't come into it knowing and feeling there was a representation issue. Right. Because my first, literally my first step in this big, you, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed, tall buildings in New York, you know, everything that you, you know about advertising from the movies, it's like you're living it. And then you have, you know, a team, not just with a leader who gets you, but the te the whole team was diverse. Right. You know, I had, you know, Chinese colleagues, LGBTQ colleagues, white, you know, black men, women. And it was it was awesome. And the work was so good because of that. Right. And it was just so fulfilling um, that I didn't. I didn't know how lucky I was, right? Um, so we could just be us, be creative, tell our stories, use our lived experience to inform, you know, our our creative solutions, and that's sort of what he demanded. And to see how he, um, his name was Mock Aram, and, and he's no longer with us, sadly. Uh, and he uh, he was just such a beacon of of inspiration for for someone who 
for young people, especially. And he, he didn't take shit from anybody. Like he was just like, you know, and he wasn't gruff. He wasn't like rough, but he also was like, look, this is, this is me, <laughs> right? Like this is, and this is, and, and he let us be us. And, um, and that's something I've kept with me, uh, uh, throughout my entire career. And, in, in even when I was put in then the op opposite situation in almost every stop after that. And I was like, whoa, okay, well, this is different. How should I approach this? What, it, what can I take from my learned experience there to, to navigate these things and make sure my voice is heard in those, in those things. So I think the, the advice I would give to, to young people or, or even mid to senior level people who are not in that situation is just to, you know, not give up hope, right? Is to continue to drive and be brave um, and don't hide from your experiences. I mean, I think that's the worst thing you can do is, is assimilate because then, you know, not only are you losing your, your, your personal and cultural identity, but you're also losing that really cool opportunity to draw from your, your culture to inform you, your creative. I mean, to me, that humanity and that empathy is what makes creative really, really cool and different and diverse. Because if we're just regurgitating stuff that we see from everybody else, it just becomes boring and there's no differentiation. And even from a business perspective, if, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm in a crowded category, then we're just regurgitating the same benefits as our competitors. Like what's cool about that? You know? So I think the more you can draw on your humanity and the more you can draw on your culture and your, your diverse perspective on something, is I think a huge opportunity. So if, if you find yourself in a situation where you're not being heard, I think, you know, find a mentor, find a coach who can help you navigate within your corporate structure that you are now to make sure your voice is heard and that, that you, if you don't see representation on the other side of, of the table leadership wise, how do you, you know, make sure your voice is not lost in, in the sea of sameness? Because if your company is just looking for someone to be an order taker and like, look, that's great, but we just want you to do that. Then you have to kind of decide if that's the right place for you, in my opinion. Great piece of advice and great insight as well in terms of what you've learned in that experience, which I think is the reason why you've won those accolades, why you've had um, that amazing learning that brought you to where you are today and made you pivot again and start again when it comes to, okay, I'm done with the agency world. Let me start with my own thing. Let me be an entrepreneur. Let me do something more meaningful, but let's dive into what triggered that decision. I would want to know what was that spark of inspiration or what was that pivotal moment that made you realize, you know what? Advertising is great. Being a network agency is great winning all these amazing awards, that ego booster is always great. And also the campaign that, you know, the brands will be raving about will always be great. But what, what led to the change of heart? What made you decide to be an entrepreneur? Sure. Yeah. I, I don't know what compelled me to, to start the business. <laughs> no, um, so I started off that first job at Ogilvy. I was an uh, interactive art director back in the late nineties where web was just sort of this bolt on, you know, it's online web, interactive, digital, whatever. So it was always the sort of like, um, secondary thing to tr traditional and full service advertising, which is kind of funny when you think about it today, like, how's that possible? Everything is connected. Everything is digital. Right. But, uh, it was so it was always sort of um having to prove the worth of of you know the skill set that we've been building but even like you know the business case for it, like hey guys like websites that's important a lot of people are you know find that's the first place people go to find more information about your brand or your cause or whatever it is people this is a thing that people are using and mobile that's you know that's actually going to be pretty important moving forward and like mobile what is how am I going to use the internet on my phone? I mean, literally those are the, you laugh at it now, but back then it was just sort of like, you had to convince folks to, to invest the time, the staff, the headcount to digital. So it was in 2008. Um, and again, you know, it, it was, it was burgeoning and I was again, your typical hardworking, you know, I was a vice president when I turned 30 at an Omnicom agency, you know, just sort of doing the expected, keep your head down, work hard. But I still sort of found myself hitting the ceiling of, you know, having to prove myself over and over, um, even though, again, the industry is pivoting towards this connected world, user-generated content, all that, those things. And when I'm in meetings, like espousing, like, look, we have to, like, rely on our community that we're building and, and, and give them a chance to uh, not just react to our content, but 
contribute to that conversation and and people are like oh gosh here you know literally like eye rolls up user gen- here's the guy talking about user generated content and again i'm like what are we talking about so um there was always this sort of like need to the the feeling that i needed to sort of always explain myself always educate always sort of you know do the song and dance um when you know the really cutting edge agencies were, were had already embraced it and it was just sort of like this frustrating again middle management great i'm an officer at an agency and I'm, you know by the time i turned 30 which is a great personal accolade but it just it was sort of frustrating because i still felt like every day was a fight um and again still not a lot of diversity at the at that time uh, not just culturally but also in, in leadership but also just diversity in thinking again like being open to be like well maybe we should you know um so that was one big piece one big input was you know just the the sort of frustration in hitting a wall of mm-hmm. something that i knew that the industry landscape was really clamoring for and even our our digital partners our digital ad networks like were like shane if you just do your own thing, we'll, we'll support you. We'll send you business. And I was like, do my own thing. What does that even mean? I I don't, I'm not an entrepreneur. Like this is what I do. And so that, that was one big piece. And I, I think what a lot of people don't know, and I want, I hope to be able to tell this, the story here is the other piece is a very personal side of it, um, which I think informed my approach and the bravely approach today. And that's humanity. So around the same time, my now wife and I were are were engaged. We're looking for wedding venues, and um, we love this particular spot uh, in in Southern Maryland. <clears throat> but we couldn't afford. You know, weddings are a racket. They're they're so expensive. Um, but this this particular venue, she had her heart set on, and you know, she, um, God bless her. She's, both her parents ha- are deceased, and um, I wanted just her our wedding to be this just really happy place. And I didn't want her to compromise. So mm-hmm. um, I approached the wedding venue that we wanted with this really exorbitant um, venue fee. And I was like, listen, can I like do your website? <laughs> you know, <laughs> listen, I'm a, I promise I'm not like a flyby. Like I'm an officer at a huge agency. I appealed to their humanity. I used our humanity. I was like, I really, we love this place. This means a lot to us. Let, let me sort of consult you on your business and making it better. The irony of it is my very, very, very first client as an entrepreneur was my wedding venue. <laughs> so I spun up a business, incorporated, did all that stuff just so I could be a legit, like, you know, again, I'm not a freelancer, just a freelancer. So I spun up a, a business and that was my very, very first client uh, was um, so that I knew then, you know, having been in the big agency world all the way up until then, um, something in me, again, appealed to my humanity to say, like, listen, you can try something different. Um, so I did, uh, that I st- decided to launch my business and, and it was in 2008 until COVID, it was the worst economic downturn of our generation. I didn't know what I was doing. It was scary. It was hard, but, you know, I leaned on the, the experience I built, but also again, I, I leaned on the humanity and the support of the people around me. And I sort of, you know, decided then that I would try to figure life out in that way and pro- professional life and, and see where it took me. And so far it's been, it's been pretty great. Wow. I love how all the stars aligned for you. <laughs> it seems that the universe loved you. So, well, probably <laughs> like, you know, you do good, you receive good as well. I believe in karma. I believe in all the positive energies being given to, you know, who we are as people and how we live our lives here. And I think how you've also applied your creative approach to get the best wedding venue for your now wife using your creativity, but also at the same time to genuinely help um, that business. And also no, it's like the Ikigai um, equation because that's the value that you can provide. Um, they're willing to pay for it. So like literally it's like, you know, match made in heaven and you pretty much had that good deal right that's exactly right and 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 that's when i sort of knew like okay i mean it, this might be uncomfortable um it might not be conventional but let's figure it out and you know to answer the second part of the question you know that's sort of what informed the second round of of this this entrepreneurial journey and this the version of the company called bravely it was you know really really leaning into that discomfort and owning it and you know using that as a selling point all of our clients are willing to take those risks um for a bigger reward creatively if you want an order taking group we may not be 
that listen that doesn't mean we don't follow directions it means that you know we uh, we are a group that prides ourselves on um doing things a different way and not just doing it the, the way it's always been done because it's been done that way we always ask the question like can it be better and if so how and it takes a lot of courage surprisingly for a lot of brands to, to do that uh, and uh so i sort of drew from that experience and and got the opinion of 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 colleagues at the time and then you know you as 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 talent like what what would drive you what would make you want to work for a company you know like like that i'm trying to build and they're like you know someone who's not afraid to take risks and you know and um it just land that that name ended up being you know perfect and synonymous with an approach that you know looking back was really part of you know my my professional dna without knowing it so it it almost like you said it's it was kismet it was karma um to land on that and i you know i give one of my colleagues uh my now colleagues credit for for bringing that name into the fold because like what, what what's the name going to be um but it, it fit our archetype perfectly and um we 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 really lean into just making sure we always ask that question, you know, um, is this brave? Is this human? Love the combination of being brave and being human at the same time and putting that in the heart of advertising and marketing and communication at this day and age where everything is so modern, technology or digital became like <laughs> the first as opposed to when you were describing earlier the secondary channel or the secondary tool that brands are incorporating into their media plans but at this day and age where we are experiencing this sometimes being human and being brave are actually you know put in the back burner because people or you know the people who are managing the brands are so used to you know being comfortable with what's tried and tested being comfortable with what's out there. And it's so difficult to be the first and the different, especially in the category that is very competitive. So if you will try to differentiate what Bravely is compared to other brand consulting agencies or ad agencies, what differentiates Bravely and why should brands explore and try to lean into what's different compared with the usual stuff that we've been so used to? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that the biggest thing that differentiates us is, again, that commitment to at least asking the question, you know, uh, do we have to do it that way again? And and listen, we, we've been approached and we get business in a multitude of different ways, whether it's referral or RFPs and all those things. But we we find that the people that, that come to know of us or the people that um, our story resonates with are those brands and orgs who need some sort of disruption they're maybe stagnant or maybe just inertia you know ha has taken them a direction where they they're plateauing in growth or whatever it is but i think that's the first key is recognizing that they're they do need something different because listen if you're if you're not willing to admit that like hey we need to shake things up then you're not going to look for an agency that that purports itself to do things differently why would you right so and and that's not to say that we, we won't run the same process um, after a thoughtful discovery, you know, and, and brave sort of discovery, because we want to do what's right. We're not going to do something different for the sake of doing it differently, but be committing to that process is what I think sets us uh, apart and, and really trying to preempt the brief, right? We try to get in and, and understand your business problems and, and give you solutions that we were thoughtful about before you even ask us what or give us a laundry list because sometimes briefs especially rfps they're biased you know that's um it's it's skewed in in in, in reasons why we may not understand why so some of our most successful clients have been conversation started from conversations like you know what's what's keeping you up at night so we're bringing then solutions proactively and i think that the brands again that can appreciate our approach to things that really was like, oh, wow, okay, that, that's different versus like, you know, lighting up to to work with brands um, that are, you know, um, just salivating for a chance to, to work on big global brands. We, we like that too, but it's like, hey, like we, we have value too. Yeah. And and all agencies do, again, this is, you know, we're, we're not poo-pooing, you know, other other folks process, but it's just not ours, right? Um, and, and we, even from the get-go in 2017, this was prior to COVID, we, we decided we would be distributed from day one and we have been. So before Zooms were normal, before hybrid, before all of that, we knew that from the get-go we would, we would be distributed because we also wanted to attract the best talent. And that was a selling point to clients. It's like client X, you know, we want your rate to go to the best talent on your business, no matter where they sit. 
So your money goes to the people working on your business, not our pool table, right? So that seemed to also resonate with with those clients. So I think it's just the willingness to have a, a structure, a thread of a process that that we adhere to, but being willing to even intrinsically look like, okay, are we getting now stagnant in our creative approach? Let's shake that up. How do we do things? So, um, just not not getting too comfortable living in the sweat scale, and that's you know we always use that sweat scale. The more an idea makes you sweat, maybe the better an idea it is. Uh, and we try to just go back to that. Are, are we are we falling victim to like okay, well this has worked before. Let's just do that. So, um, you know, there are num a number of reasons why creative agencies and, and ad agencies in general sort of stay the course. That um, that makes sense, but it's just we want to try something different and then so far it's worked you know we've we've gotten some pretty awesome and amazing clients and partners and and talent internally who who have bought into into that culture and that approach and you know some days it's awesome some days it's hard that such is entrepreneurship such, such is life right um but i think again a commitment to understanding that's how it's going to be and knowing that like hey it's not going to be all roses. I think once you embrace that, that's the bravely way for sure. It's just, it's just, you know, every day is a new day and uh, you, you, you address every challenge as it comes and, and let the chips fall where they may. I think um, one great point that you've mentioned is that striking that balance between something that will definitely work, something that, yes, it's a bit risky, it's different, but at the end of the day will still work, especially for the brands that you are helping grow the businesses and the people on the other side that you're supporting so that they can meet their objectives. So as the leader of, you know, the agency of the organization, I'm pretty sure that there'll be a lot of, you know, pitched ideas that are risky, that are, you know, haven't been tried before, but are very refreshing, very new, very now. And of course you have the brief of the client. As the president and chief experience officer, how do you strike that balance and how do you manage your creative team or, you know, the very talented people internally when it comes to distilling ideas, putting together the final pitch to your clients and making sure that what you will be presenting is something that you will be confident enough to present and say that this is the bravely way and this will work? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I really, I really think it's different every time, you know, our, our, our portfolio is diverse um, by design. You know, we don't want to be um, a category group. You know, oh, we're just the sports group, or we're just the entertainment group, or just the uh, you know nonprofit group. We like to work for categories that we all have personal affinity for. That everyone has a voice. We're a very very flat organization. I mean, it's while I'm like sort of the lead, I mean, everyone has a voice and has a say whether sometimes whether even we go after a piece of business, right? So, so creative pitching internally is very, very much a, you know, hey, let's all, everyone has equal voice here, strategists, project managers, whomever, let's all, you know, get in a room, <laughs> a, a virtual room, a Slack or whatever it is, and, or, or a hangout and um, let's just have at it. And I think that is important to me, just making sure everyone knows they have a voice and being respectful of each other, um, I think is another one. And again, having that humanity and empathy, um, that's another lens. And we use empathy in every, every pitch deck that we send. I mean, that's, we really lean on that as a differentiator as well, making sure that, you know, we are being thoughtful of, of each other, of our clients needs, of our clients targets needs that finding that balance is just making sure that everyone has empathy. Uh, respect for each other, knows they have a voice. And you'd be surprised there's actually few and far between are those conflicts that get, you know, deep enough to where I'm like, okay, let me let me be the tiebreaker or something like that. Like almost always on the on the the ideas that go to the client, we're all very, very much behind. Uh, um and then that we again we control what we can control and that's another big uh mantra. It's hard to it's hard to, you know, live by but it, it's we definitely try you know it, it's there to say like we can only take an idea so far we can control what we can control whether it's the client um input or even what goes out in the world right um and convincing the client to be like hey let the chips fall where they may you know there's a, they're investing a lot of money in this and we get that but there's only so much you can control as as with as much data or as much you know retargeting or algorithms and all those things like all those things are changing in ways that we can't control so it's like are we telling the right story you want to tell controlling our narrative the way we want to do it 
and you know, crossing our fingers and 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 hoping it goes well. Um, and that's not a, meant to sound like a, a blind sort of like faith in an idea. Obviously, they're they're well thought out and and have insight. You know, not getting stressed about um, you know things beyond your control um, is is something that we try to to live by as well. So that that sort of lives through um, you know our pitches both internally and and with the client. That is very inspiring and definitely very credible to hear is knowing that the output or the proposal that I'll be receiving has gone through that entire process and also coming from a culture internally within the agency where everyone is heard, everyone would have the same equal voice. Um, that's really very refreshing knowing how agencies work before, especially <laughs> the big network ones, sure. which what do you think right now since you know coming from your background again your origin story as a filipino american and we know that it's not a very typical industry where folks like us will be entering into beyond an employee all the more as the founder or the lead of a company that you are starting um when you were starting the agencies that you founded were there challenges that you've experienced because of your race or your ethnicity and how did you address those challenges were there situations that you felt that you're not given the equal footing or you have to fight harder, you have to pitch harder because of your background. 1000% yes. You know, it, it would be disingenuous for me to say that um, race and culture don't play a part in in um, how successful any business is, um, especially in a business like advertising and marketing where there's just so few people of color who own and run in, in leadership across the board. So. Anyone that, that denies that is just, you know, they're just not being truthful. So yes, of course, um, culture absolutely affects our ability to, um, to be sustainable and, and, um, and we do have to work harder for sure. Uh, and navigating it. I mean, there's a couple of, you know, very pragmatic things that, that, that I do and that I would, you know, advice I would give to, to other founders and that's, you know, relying on, you know, supplier diversity programs. You know, there are a number of, of small business initiatives, women owned, black owned, uh, we're, we're part of the, we're certified by the national minority supplier diversity council, just gets getting certified just so that there is a sort of, at least a legitimized, like, Hey, I'm recognized by this council. Um, and that, that group, their charge is to, folks of color in the rooms in which they would never get a, a shot to be in. Um, and a lot of, of big brands and a lot of agencies have programs where their, 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 uh, their business requires a certain percentage of diverse owned businesses to, to participate. And I don't think that's, you know, any sort of affirmative action sort of thing. It's just like, Hey, why open your aperture? <laughs> don't just go to the same old, good old boy network um, partners and just like give everyone a shot, a fair shot. And listen, we don't want to be given anything. Uh, I, I'm the first to say that, like, listen, I, I'll put our team up against any team, any agency, any big agency, big or small. And again, let the chips fall where they may, but I have a lot of confidence in our group and a lot of confidence in our, in our experience and our approach to where we know that we can, we can win business with the, if we're given a shot, if you just take our faces out of the, the deck and it's just black and white solutions, right? Deck for deck, we we're right there. It, it's certainly there. We we it is getting better in some cases, in other categories maybe not. But you know, all, all we can do is just keep working. I mean, that's you know, we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna give up. I wouldn't ever tell anyone to to put their to put their head down and, or feel sorry for themselves or sorry for us. You know, I think being a part of a community like Asians in advertising, which didn't exist 25 years ago, um, when I was coming up, I think, you know, them simply being is a huge boon. That mindset, um, Shane, love that very positive and pragmatic attitude as well of, okay, this is the reality. But then again, we're willing to give it a fight. We're willing to find ways to make sure that we're going to be of equal footing based on merit um, because we are here to prove that it's not the color of our skin or our origin story that defines the success of the proposal that we're putting out there or the kind of output that will be supporting the brand that we're pitching for, but really our lived experience, our creativity, 
and the way we work together as a tribe, as a community, um, that will allow for us to really meaningfully contribute to the business that we're pitching for. I definitely love that. And I'm with you as well when it comes to, you know, appreciating and recognizing that back in the day, there's no um, collective group in our community that speaks and tries its best to represent for us. So I think we're just at the start of this hopefully change that will happen in the future that will further level the playing field that will be good for the coming generations, which makes me feel more excited about the future of advertising and marketing and for the AAPI community here in this country and in other progressive Western countries, which makes me interested to also ask you, given all these you know, developments, not just in, their, in our industry, but also in the changing landscape of you know, how humans now consume media, how we are being wooed by different brands because of the different touch points and channels that we are exposed to. What are these new exciting things that you have yet to learn that you're excited about? And um, what makes you feel energized waking up in the morning, loving and um, being hopeful with the things that you will be experiencing as an advertising lead and as a marketer? Man, that's that's a great question. I mean, I think um, the thing I'm most excited to learn about is, um, I mean, if if no one if if everyone doesn't answer AI right now, um, they're lying because uh, I think. I mean, and listen, it's 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 the curve has been extremely steep. A, a good colleague, a good friend, and former colleague of mine, uh, Ian Latchman Singh, he's he's spent some time in AI uh, at uh, uh, AIML, and he's been talking about it for years. But it's just you know recently just exploded. So while it's you know artificial intelligence or machine learning has been around, I think only now in the past. 12 to 18 months are we really starting to see it catch fire with common vernacular, even with like household names, like you could say chat GPT and even, you know, maybe our, our, our parents might even, my parents won't know, but, but, you know, like, uh, but you know, it's people will know what that is, right. Uh, it, it's, it's everywhere. So I'm really excited to see how steep that, that innovation curve will continue to be. You know, I've done a couple of talks uh, around AI in the last uh, six to eight months, and it literally changes and updates every time I do one. The the speed and rate of of in which these these platforms are are um, coming out is just, is such a fascinating time. And you know, there's a lot of of, of fear around it. Um, I personally am very very pro AI in the creative field because we still think AI needs humans to, to reach its full potential. Um, so we're not worried about it, you know, taking jobs and things like that. Um, it, in fact, I think that it really helps us get better at our jobs. And it sort of, it sort of makes us prove like, Hey, if, if the story, if the idea if that nugget of an idea, this nebulous thing that is category agnostic platform agnostic, if that thing is strong, then whatever tool that you use to bring it to life, whether that be, you know, television or digital or mobile or, or AI, if that concept is sound, then why not use whatever the, the tools you have at your disposal to make it freaking amazing. So I've found that, you know, we're, we're, we dabble in, in, in it, in our, in our processes, we found that it really helps, you know, speed up those mundane tasks that used to take hours and hours. It's like literally in a click uh, idea generation, you know, just helping us, you know, uh, cut the fat as it were, you know, that, that, um, immersion phase, uh, in, in the creative process where you're just sort of like, just putting ideas up on the wall, you know, using a traditional term where you just like sort of post everything up on the wall. Um, when you cut through that fat, if you can do that with AI in minutes to sort of like, okay, here's a hundred ideas. Okay, cool. It would take you hours, days, weeks to sort of just gener simply generate those ideas, which 90% of them you're going to throw out anyway. Right. So we've, we really embrace it. We think it's, it's exciting. That's what I'm really, really excited to learn about in, in the immediate term and in the future and in terms of what gets me up every day. I mean, I, I, that's sort of the opposite. It's, it's, it's not technology based. It again is it's, it's the, the humanity that I get to, to live with um, and work with every day. The, the people in, in my life that, that inspire you know, me personally and, and professionally that I, I'm so lucky to work with amazing colleagues who are, again, couldn't be more diverse 
age in race you know um and i love that and i and i draw energy from them and and um the humanity even in our household uh, my wife and three three boys so um those lived experiences inform how i approach the business uh, again it, it, i don't want to lose that humanity and again going back to that story of like yeah humanity is what actually started my entrepreneurial journey um, i hope to never lose that so i really honestly hope when I ask you that question that you're going to answer AI as one of the answers. <laughs> and I love in your roundabout way how you've ended AI with the human aspect of humanity and goodness as well, because I'm also a firm believer that we should embrace AI, but we should use our good side as human beings to make sure that it wouldn't go haywire, because I think that's the only way for us to approach all these new technologies, all these new developments in the world, and for us to still be at the forefront of managing them and to make sure that it works in our favor and not against us. Which leads me to my last question to you, Shane, which is also the same question that I asked all my guests after hearing that you have three boys and your household with your wife as well, managing that. What for you is a meaning of a meaningful life? And if you're gonna share that to your three little boys, um, who is definitely part of the AAPI community because their dad have lived that experience. What would you tell them so that they can live that every single day? I love that theme. I love the theme of your podcast and, you know, meaning, meaningful moments is such a powerful uh, platform. So kudos to you for, for building your, your content platform around that. I think it's awesome. And what's meaningful to me is making sure that there is meaning for those boys and that they see that they have purpose, uh, whatever that may be. Right. Um, I try not to be too heavy handed again. I'll take my, my, my learned experiences and, in guiding and guiding them into what their interests are. And, um, you know, I certainly obviously will always keep them safe, always keep them fed, but also let them sort of discover meaning for themselves and that what is meaningful to me may not be as what is meaningful to them. And I think I hope to just bestow on, on them just the, the, the comfort to do that and the courage to do that and the courage to step out and find what meaning is to them. Um, because that's what it is for me is just making sure that those boys, you know, have a meaningful life because their meaningful life is what, what is meaningful to me for sure. Beautiful. And with that, I want to give you the floor, Shane. I'm sure a lot of our audience, all the folks who heard your story and your experience would definitely want to find out more and reach out to you. Let us know how we can best reach out to you, message you, or visit your platform so we can find out more. Absolutely. No, I, I appreciate that. And and for thank and and you too for, for having me on. And we can be reached at, at bravelycreated.com. Uh, Bravely Created is our our Insta, our, our LinkedIn, me personally, please, 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 please message me on LinkedIn, SB Santiago on Instagram. You know, I, I love, you know, conversations like these where, you know, I, I, I've learned a lot from you and I'm, and I hope to continue to do so. And, and from you and your guests in, 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 in future pods as well, uh, just, I would love to be a part of any conversations moving forward that, that stem from this and hope I can you know, contribute in a meaningful way to, to your audience members for sure. Thank you so much, Shane. It was a pleasure talking to you. And again, this will just be the start. We will continue to talk to each other and hopefully collaborate in more in the future. Thank you that so much. That sounds great. Thank you. Appreciate it.